And we move on to our last, the last talk of our session, which is given by Anlin from Baylor College of Medicine. And uh, we are looking here at a specific problem or challenge, which is vaccination in immunocompromised patients. Thank you. Uh, here are my disclosures. So my talk is going to switch gears a little bit. I will be talking about the efforts we've been doing to target viral infections in immunocompromised patients using adoptively transferred T cells. Um, so first, just a, a, a quick note about viral infections in allogeneic stem cell transplant recipients. These remain a major cause of post-transplant morbidity and mortality. And that's really highlighted here in this slide, which is taken from the CIBMTR, just showing that 17% of all deaths after allogeneic stem cell transplant are due to infections that occur in the post-transplant period. And the reason why infections are so prevalent in this patient population actually has to do with the therapy itself, so the actual transplantation. So here on the left in, in the, the dark, um, uh, sorry, the, the point is not working, but on the, the left-hand side you have a patient who's about to be transplanted, but before they can receive the stem cells from their allogeneic donor, their immune system is essentially wiped out so that their T cells don't reject the transplant. And uh, because of this, then, you have a window of time, and this can vary depending on the type of transplant the patient receives, but you have a window of time post-transplant where the patient is at risk for all types of pathogen, path pathogens that would normally be controlled by the immune system. And uh, our focus in the lab is, is on viral infections that occur in this window of immune compromise post-transplant. And these infections can be associated with latent viruses, um, with a range of lytic viruses. And so our focus has been on targeting Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, HHV6, BK virus, and adenovirus. So the approach that we have taken to try to prevent or treat these infections in this period of immune compromise is to try to generate virus-specific T cells from the stem cell donor. So you have the stem cell donor who's giving the stem cells to the patient. And what we've been doing is expanding virus-specific T cells from the same donor as the companion product to the stem cells, and then infusing these cells to the patient in that window of compromise to prevent these infections from occurring. And of course, these cells just need to work for this period of time until the patient's own immune system reconstitutes post the transplant. We have a lot of experience in this patient population and using this particular type of therapy. So the first studies in our group were done in the mid-90s, actually, um, done in the pre-rituximab era where cells were generated that targeted Epstein-Barr virus. And since then, we've progressively increased the number of viruses that we have targeted using adoptively transferred T cells. Uh, initially, CMV and adenovirus were added to our repertoire. And most recently, we've been targeting additionally BK virus and HHV6. And while we've targeted more and more viruses over time, because all of these and many more can be problematic at this time post-transplant, we've progressively also worked on our manufacturing platform to really streamline and, and make this process as efficient as possible. And I just showed the timeline. At the beginning, it used to take us three months to generate every single T-cell product we generated. And now we can effectively generate a product in 10 days that targets up to five viruses. And so I want to walk you through some of our recent results with our, our, most, um, our most recent product to make it to the clinic, which is our T-cell product targeting five viruses. So this is in clinical testing currently. We are generating T-cell products targeting adenovirus, EBV, CMV, BK virus, and HHV6. And to stimulate T cells, to expand virus-specific T cells from the donor, we have generated overlapping peptide libraries spanning immunogenic antigens from each of our target viruses, and those are listed on the right-hand side. And these peptide libraries are 15 mers overlapping by 11 amino acids, and with this footprint, it gives us the ability to be able to activate both CD4 and CD8 positive T cell responses. 
We use these to directly stimulate the donor PBMCs, which we subsequently expanded for 10 days in a GREX device, which very effectively expands virus-specific T cells in the presence of cytokines that really induce the activation process. And at the end, we have a polyclonal population of cells with different subsets active against the different target viruses. Using this process, we get very effective T cell expansion. So in about 10 days, we're very reproducibly expanding, uh, getting a mean fold expansion of about 13 fold. And the cells that we do produce are all T cells, so they're all CD3 positive cells, a mixture of helper and cytotoxic cells with effector and central memory markers. So this tells us that the cells that we infuse to patients will be able to uh, effectively target viruses in infected individuals, but also persist long term and enter, enter the memory pool. And they are indeed specific for the viruses that we're targeting using our methodology. And here we're looking and characterizing the specificity profile of our cells using an interferon gamma LA spot, which quantifies the number of cells that are able to produce interferon gamma in response to specific antigenic stimulation. So moving on to the clinical trial, which again is still open. This first in man study uh, was tested in the context of a dose escalation study. We have to date treated 21 patients at doses ranging from 5 million cells to 20 million cells per meter squared. And just to give you context, the average adult is about 2 meters squared. So at the top dose level, we're giving a total cell dose of 40 million cells. So quite a small cell dose here. We, this cl clinical trial calls for a single infusion of these ex vivo expanded virus specific T cells and if the patient has uh, achieves benefit from this um, but not a complete response, we can give additional infusions. These are the characteristics of the patients that we have infused in this trial, a range of different transplant types from matched related to haploidentical identical transplant recipients who have been transplanted for a variety of diseases, both malignant and non-malignant. Um, and importantly, we are enrolling both pediatric and adult patients in this clinical trial. In this study, it's both a prophylaxis and a treatment study. We have infused four patients who were considered very high risk for a viral reactivation event post-transplant. We infused those patients prophylactically and they remained infection-free for at least three months post-infusion. And this is really the high risk window for uh, reactivation. Um, but I think importantly, we've also used these cells to treat patients with active disease as measured by viremia or actual frank disease that had, um, had uh, evolved in these patients. And I'll spend a little bit more time on these patients. In this group, we have a total of 17 patients, but as I showed you at the beginning, this is a very high risk window for these patients and many infections can occur. And I think this is really nicely showcased here because of our 17 patients, only five had a single viral issue. All the rest had issues with two, three, or four or viral infections all happening at the same time in these patients. Uh, first and foremost, in these phase one clinical trials, the, the major question is whether this uh, adoptive cell therapy is safe. And in the study, we've seen no dose limiting toxicity at any three of our tested dose levels. We also look for any evidence that our cells induce graft versus host disease in these patients who are post allo transplant. And we saw only four instances of patients uh, developing very low grade GVHD, um, only one of which required any steroid therapy. So in summary, these cells are safe for this particular patient population. Now, do they actually uh, produce clinical benefit? And I'll, I'll just run through some examples for the different viruses that we've targeted. Here's a case of a patient who had an adenovirus infection, and we're tracking this adenovirus infection by measuring viral load in this patient's peripheral blood. The dotted line shows this viral load over time in the weeks prior to T-cell therapy. As you can see, there's an exponential increase in the viral load. Um, it does plateau at one point, which is when the clinical team started using um, sort of nonspecific antiviral therapy to try to get the virus under control. And although there was an initial blunting effect, the virus started recurring. So at this time point, we infused our donor-derived virus-specific T cells, and this had an immediate impact on the viral load, which drops away to zero within a number of weeks. 
And this effect corresponds with our ability now to be able to detect an increase in the circulating frequency of adenovirus-specific T cells in this patient's peripheral blood. So we've infused the product, that product has seen the viral infection, and those cells have expanded in vivo. Here's another case, this time for EBV, and in this patient, this patient had actually a detectable viral load, again, that's shown by the dotted line, but had developed a post-transplant malignancy called post-transplant proliferative disease, and you can see that on the scans shown on the left-hand side. But again, upon infusion of our virus-specific T cells, the viral load drops away. This correlates with an increase in the circulating frequency of EBV-specific T cells, and the post-infusion scan is completely clear. And this therapy, uh, this clinical benefit was achieved absent other therapies. And finally, just one last example for this clinical trial. Here's a patient who was treated for BK virus. So this is a patient who also had tissue disease, um, BK hemorrhagic cystitis. So in this patient, we were detecting uh, the viral load both in the blood and the urine. Here I'm showing you the viral load in the blood, which drops away post-infusion, again coincidence with an increase in the circulating frequency of BK-specific T cells. Here is what the picture looked like in the urine of this patient. And it was interesting, in this patient we managed to get a biopsy sample from the bladder taken when we were seeing this really precipitous drop in the viral load post-infusion of our T cells, and we were actually able to detect our T cells at the site of disease in this patient, again showing the ability of these T cells to home to tissue disease sites and actually mediate antiviral effects. So in this clinical trial, here are the definitions we use for a benefit, a viral load, a complete response was defined as a viral load returning to the normal range with resolution of any clinical signs and symptoms, and the partial response was at least a 50% decrease in the viral load, as well as uh, clinical improvement. And in our 17 patients with a total of uh, 40 infections, we achieved an overall response rate of 95%. All the tick marks here show complete responses, and PRs are indicated by the PR initials. And, and so clearly there is benefit. I mean, it makes sense to apply a T-cell therapy in this space, so the problem occurs because these patients don't have their own T-cell response, and therefore making T-cells and putting them into patients really does bridge that, that gap in their immune response. But I do want to point out one issue which we have seen using these donor-derived virus-specific T-cells. And that is the fact that we can very effectively provide patients with immunity derived from the stem cell donor so long as that donor has been exposed to these viruses previous to the transplant. And that's really highlighted very nicely in this boxed example here, where we had a patient who had a reactivation of EBV, HHV6, and BK virus. When we infused our, our donor-derived virus-specific T cell line, we effectively took care of the EBV and HHV6, but not the BK virus. And in subsequent studies, when we looked back at the donor from whom we generated that product, it turned out that the donor was seronegative for BK virus. So there was no memory response in that donor to that virus, and hence we couldn't expand it and provide the patient with that coverage. So just to summarize these donor-derived virus-specific T-cell studies, we've demonstrated the safety of this product, and we've seen activity against all five of the viruses that we have targeted to date using this type of therapy. But we're always seeking to identify ways to more broadly implement this type of adoptive T-cell transfer approach. Um, and so, so with that, when we looked at these donor-derived studies, we did identify some limitations that precluded broader implementation, including the fact that for, for the donor-derived studies, we have to generate an individualized therapy. So we're generating one product from the stem cell donor, which is destined for one specific patient. So individualized therapy. We're precluded from generating these very specific T cells if you have a seronegative donor, and that's particularly problematic, for example, in cord blood transplant recipients where you have an entirely naive uh, source of material from which to generate the cells. And then the other, the other point to make is that we are generating these cells prospectively, and it is a 10-day manufacturing process, but nevertheless, for a very sick patient, one still has to wait for those cells to be made and released for clinical use, and that delay can oftentimes be fatal for these patients. And so these reasons have actually driven us to explore 
the potential for using virus-specific T-cells as an off-the-shelf therapy uh, to treat patients with infections using a partially HLA-matched T-cell product. And so the idea here is, so say for example, I'm this, pe I'm this donor, so I'm a transplant-eligible donor, seropositive for all the target viruses. So what we, we tried to do is generate virus-specific T-cell products from healthy, eligible donors, cryopreserve these cells in multiple vials, so these are very stable when maintained in liquid nitrogen. And the question that we wanted to ask clinically is whether we could use my cells, for example, to treat allogeneic stem cell transplant recipients who were infected with the target viruses and who were partially HLA matched with me. Um, and so here, I just bring back this little schematic again just to, to show you the, the clinical trial where, where we have been doing in this space. So with these off-the-shelf cells, what we've been doing is using them to treat patients who have had a viral reactivation post-transplant. We then administer these partially HLA-matched cells to bridge the patient until their normal immune reconstitution occurs. So moving to the clinical trial, this is a phase one, phase two study, also open and ongoing. But in this trial, we are only treating patients who have infections that have proven refractory to conventional antiviral therapies. So the, the patients that we're enrolling on the study have to have failed conventional antiviral agents for at least two weeks or be unable to tolerate conventional antivirals. We are not infusing any patients with acute uh, graft-versus-host disease greater than grade two, and there are some other inclusion criteria, as you can see. Uh, the clinical protocol itself, so this is a fixed-dose clinical protocol. We are using 20 million cells per meter squared for infusion, and again, if the patient achieves clinical benefit, absent uh, toxicity, the patient can receive additional doses. And to date, we've infused 54 patients, 34 have received a single infusion of cells, and for 20 patients, we've infused two or more infusions. And this is a very busy slide. There are just a few take-home messages from this. So this summarizes the 54 patients that we've treated. Uh, again, for a total of 62 infections, and below in blue are highlighted the patients who we've treated using a single virus-specific T-cell line for multiple infections. And the infections that we are most frequently called to treat are CMV, BK virus, and we've recently gone through a bit of a spike in adenovirus. And adenovirus is a seasonal virus, not always problematic, but when it is, it can be a very big clinical problem. Looking at the patient characteristics, again, we're treating uh, infections in a variety of patients who've received transplants um, from uh, cord blood right the way up to match-related donor transplants, and again, who have been transplanted for a variety of malignant and non-malignant disorders. Looking first and foremost at the safety, so remember, this is a partially HLA-matched virus-specific T-cell product that we're infusing to the, uh, an allogeneic stem cell transplant recipient. So the key question here is safety. Are these cells safe to infuse to patients, and will we see any evidence of graft-versus-host disease? And this slide summarizes uh, uh, the events that we've seen in this clinical trial to date. In total, we have had eight patients that developed uh, grade one or grade two skin GVHD, um, but only three of these cases were de novo. So de novo meaning that they occurred for the first time post-infusion. So in all the other cases, there was a pre-existing issue that had been waxing and waning over time. We had one patient that developed a GI-GVHD flare, but again, this occurred when their immune suppression was being tapered anyway, so not clear whether there was any relation to the, the virus-specific T-cell infusion. Three of our patients developed transient fevers, and one patient had a localized lymph node pain. So overall, a very uh, um, safe profile in these patients. And again, so now the, the big question, do these partially HLA-matched cells produce clinical benefit? And again, I'll run through some examples. Uh, the layout of the slides is the same. Here we're looking at the viral load in the dotted line. And as you can see in this patient, prior to VST infusion, their viremia is present for a number of months post-infusion. Despite antiviral therapy, we infused our very specific T cells and the viral load away, and again, this is coincident with a detectable increase in the circulating frequency of CMV-specific T cells post-infusion. Here's a similar picture for EBV. Again, viral load drops away very nicely, and the T cell response comes up. 
Here's an example for HHV6. Again, this is just the viral load dropping away within a couple of weeks of infusion. Um, and here is a case of a patient with BK virus. Again, this is a patient with BK hemorrhagic cystitis. And this uh, viral load, uh, the line looks at the viral load in the urine of this patient. And again, this drops away nicely, coincidence with an increase in the circulation frequency of BK-specific T cells. But I do want to spend uh, just another minute on these BK patients. So every single patient, as I noted at the beginning, uh, BK virus is one of the viruses that we're called on to treat most frequently in this clinical trial. And every single patient that we treated had BK disease. So that was manifest either as BK hemorrhagic cystitis, which was in the majority of patients, and we even had a couple of patients with nephritis. But because all of these patients had disease, we could also use um, disease uh, uh, grading tools to be able to um, categorize, I suppose, the benefit that we were seeing in these patients. And so in this study, we're using the NCI cystitis grading scale to look at the benefit of our therapy in these patients. As you can see, uh, at the time we treat these patients, most of them have gross hematuria. They are transfusion dependent for the most part. They're all receiving med medications for pain control. They're all hospitalized. They have dysuria. They're really very miserable with their BK hemorrhagic cystitis. And within a week of receiving, or within a couple of weeks of receiving our cells, there's a drop in this grade uh, by at least one point, which is significant clinical benefit. And, and if you to take anything away, for the patients, this is probably the most meaningful slide of this whole uh, slide deck, because this drop in grade really significantly improves the way the patients feel post-infusion of our cells. And so ultimately, their hematuria um, resolves, they have less pain, they're urinating a lot less frequently, they can sleep again, they can get out of hospital. And so this is a huge impact on the patients. Um, uh, who we're treating in this study. So overall, back to this very busy slide I showed you at the beginning of this off-the-shelf therapy. Despite the fact that these cells are partially HLA matched, we're really seeing response rates that are absolutely comparable with the studies that we have done using donor-derived cells. So overall, the response rate that we've achieved in this patient population is standing at 94% currently. And the point I would like to make is because we're treating only patients who have refractory infections in this clinical trial, I think arguably we're treating patients who are far sicker using these off-the-shelf cells than we have been do doing previously with our donor-derived products. And I think that's evidenced here because I've highlighted all of the patients in this clinical trial who had measurable disease, and that was BK hemorrhagic cystitis or BK nephritis, HHV6 encephalitis, CMV colitis, EBV PTLD. We really have treated a spectrum of patients with a spectrum of diseases in this clinical trial and achieved benefit with the cells. And these, this occurred in patients who had not done well with conventional antiviral therapies. So just for the last moment or two of this talk, I want to spend a little bit of time um, trying to convince you that the benefit that we're seeing truly is due to the cells that we're infusing. Um, and, and I'll tell you a little bit of a story of how we've been trying to tease out whether the clinical benefit is related to our third-party cells versus anything that could be associated with endogenous immune reconstitution. And this is a patient in our clinical trial who, had, who was treated for CMV. And here the red line just shows that over time, post-infusion, we saw a very nice increase in the circulating frequency of CMV-specific T cells in this patient's peripheral blood. Now to give you a little bit more detail about this patient. So on the top, I've put the patient's HLA types. The patient was HLA A2, A3, B40, DR13, and DQ6. And we chose to infuse a line that was matched at HLA A2 and had very strong CMV activity that was presented and recognized in the context of A2. And, and that was really what we were banking on, the benefit being associated with in this patient. So we are able to measure T cell responses against epitopes present in the context of A2, but we also do a, a lot of characterization of our T cell products. And so we also knew, for example, that this particular VST line that we had infused to this patient had activity presented in the context of DR3. 
Um, and then we also wanted to understand what was happening with the patient's own immune response, so we decided to monitor activity in the context of B40. So if we saw responses against peptides presented in A2, that would be a shared response. If we saw activity against DR3, we know that that indicates that our cells are persisting in the patient's peripheral blood post-infusion. And if we saw activity against, uh, presented in the context of B40, that would be indicative of the patient's endogenous immune recovery starting to happen and reconstitution post-transplant occurring. So what we anticipated is that very soon post-infusion, all the activity that was mediated by the T cells would be derived from the product that we had infused to this patient. And that's indeed the case here. And I think this is indicated because the only activity we can see is against shared HLA-A2 epitopes or against the virus-derived DR, uh, DR allele. However, over time, when we look a little bit later on, now the patient's own immune system is starting to reconstitute, and for the first time we can see their own immunity represented by peptide recognition in the context of B40 uh, starting to come back. And we have seen this pattern now in multiple patients over time, where initially all the activity appears to be mediated by the product, the third party product we're infusing, and then over time that starts switching as the patient's immune system recovers. So in summary then, um, I hope I've demonstrated to you that it is very feasible to generate virus-specific T-cell products that are not targeted to a single virus but can actually be specific for multiple viruses that are clinically problematic in this patient population. We've demonstrated the safety of these products when infused to patients, both as donor-derived and off-the-shelf third-party products. We have seen activity of these cells against all of the viruses that we've targeted to date, and that's both in patients where we're just measuring the viral load in blood or urine, but also in patients who have measurable disease. Um, and with our third party off-the-shelf cells, we have seen that these cells can persist out to 12 weeks post-infusion. Um, so, so just a, a last point. What I think the off-the-shelf therapy really allows you to do is to be able to treat all comers with a product that is immediately ready for use, can be prospectively generated, and can be done in a tailor-made way to really support the broad patient population that is, is at risk of viral infections. And I think for the first time, what this allows a T-cell therapy is to really look more like a conventional drug than ever before, to be available as an off-the-shelf for administration uh, therapeutically. And with that, I'd just like to acknowledge all the people that are involved in these clinical trials. With any clinical trial, it really is a huge team effort from regulatory to GMP manufacturing to QA, QC, and then the people that do the correlative studies. And with that, I'd be very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for this impressive data. There are questions, yes? Hi, yeah, so I was just wondering uh, how closely do you need to match the HLA types for the third party? And a corollary question then is how many different donor populations do you need to have to get coverage of the, the potential recipients that you would, you know, if you wanted to cover everybody given the, you know, the matching? Yeah, so uh, I'll take the second question first. So we've done a lot of analysis of transplant patients. Um, you know, we're Houston-based, so we really do have a diverse patient population. And if you choose your donors well, you can probably get away with a, a bank that's 20 to 25 donors big, so not big at all. Um, the lines that we have administered to patients range from one of eight HLA match up to seven of eight HLA matches. But if you, so, but I will say in general, we're infusing lines that are probably matched at three to four alleles to the majority of patients. Um, just to back it up, if you do want to infuse a product that's just a 1 on 8 HLA match, you need to be sure that you have antiviral activity against the infecting virus through that shared allele. Whereas if you're a little bit more broad in terms of the HLA matching, and these lines are so polyclonal with multiple activities through multiple alleles, you really can relax that um, 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 in terms of the characterization that you have to do. I uh, just want to follow up question. How long do the third party donor uh, 
like how long will they last in the freezer basically? So in this study, we, we actually um, had allowed for persistent studies out to 12 weeks. So three months was when we had to stop just the way the protocol was written. Now, in the patients that we could track them, we didn't always see persistence out to 12 weeks post-infusion. But again, these patients are a spectrum of patients. So a typical cord blood transplant recipient is probably not going to reconstitute normally for maybe nine months post-transplant. Whereas your match-related donors cannot uh, sometimes be normally reconstituted by three months post-transplant. So I think the persistence of these cells ultimately will be a function of how fast normal reconstitution occurs in these individuals. So spectacular data. With adenovirus, they have, there's numerous different serotypes, and I'm wondering with your peptides, are you generating against different serotypes or are you targeting specific serotypes? Yeah, so that's a great question. And actually that reminds me of an answer you gave. So I did that, it was my first pro stop project to really analyze and characterize the immune response to adenovirus. So the antibody response to adenovirus is against the hypervariable regions of the virus. In stark contrast to that, the T cell response is very narrow and against regions of the virion that are highly conserved. So much so, actually, if you mutate some of these regions, the virus uh, uh, fails to form. So, it, it, you know, it's, it's basically a life or death kind of decision whether or not these sequences are there, which is very lucky for us because what it means is you can choose any given serotype and induce a T cell response that is cross-reactive against all the 50 odd serotypes. And in, in some of our previous studies, we've actually done that where we've detected multiple serotypes in the patient and seen the clearance of the different serotypes using a T cell product it, that was initially induced using a, a, a type C virus. Just superb results in a Thank very you. important area. Uh, so, so Patients being transplanted for a variety of primary immune deficiencies and immune dysfunction diseases mm -hmm. who come to the transplant mm. with active viral infections mm -hmm. is a really uh, special and problematic situation. And, and, and that's my, really two questions. Number one, were any of the patients that you treated so far in the study within that group of patients who had active only partially controlled infections yeah. as they went into the transplant. Um, and secondly, uh, would they be eligible? And, and when would you give these? When would you uh, give these cells? So we have. So in this study, we've tra treated patients who were post-transplant, so had primary immune deficiencies and post-transplant. But you're absolutely right with with the screening that's happening now, and and really what it turns out with some of these. Um, babies is that they can't get to transplant because they have all these viral issues. So I think that's the next space to go with these T cells and the other area that I think needs to be exploited is um, after solid organ transplant actually. So I think there's huge scope to extend this to other individuals who are immune compromised but I, I, I completely agree that it makes sense. It's just not the way this protocol was written or the study performed. Understood. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, uh, great results. Um, so I was going to ask the same question about the adenovirus, so thanks for that answer. But um, with regard to the persistence up to 12 weeks, so mm -hmm. your protocol, I think you said a couple of times now that it was, that's as far as it went. But mm -hmm. have you seen uh, any recurrences in the patients where you, you weren't able to measure anything at 12 weeks? Um, so you'll remember that I think it was 35 patients received a single infusion and then we had patients that received two or more infusions and some of those subsequent infusions were done because so we had a patient with a viral issue we infused there was initial control maybe not complete clearance or an, a, a recurrence event and so some of those subsequent infusions were done to deal with recurrences actually and with those recurrences do you have any um, insight as to why those patients recurred versus the others? Was there anything that stood out? Yeah, I mean, it could well be the lack of persistence of our products. I can't say conclusively because we just didn't have the samples to test that in every single patient, but it could be that. We didn't see any emergence of um, any escape mutants, um, if you like. So, um, yeah, so we, you know, beyond that, beyond doing those type of studies, no. Um, again, I think, I think the key here, and I think what's important to understand about these off-the-shelf cells, 
is we can actually make billions of cells now, and they didn't really go into our scale-up processes. So actually giving repeated infusions is no barrier to these, uh, to, to, to continuing to infuse. There's, there's no safety signature associated with this that we, you would be concerned about doing that. I think just the way we wrote the study is we would do a single infusion, see what happened, see who required other, other treatments, you know, for subsequent infusions or not. And as I pointed out, the majority required a single infusion, and that was it. Um, sorry, there's a guy, he's making it. I think we have to wrap up or something. Is that right? Just one quick one? Yeah, uh, of well, I can just ask after, but, um, you know, how do you see this sort of, I mean, you know, the results are encouraging, but how would you see this being implemented outside of Houston and, you know, being taken to multiple Oh, centers. yeah, so I didn't get into this actually. So before the, we did this study, we've done a previous multi-center study. So you can do centralized manufacturing of these cells. Like I said to the first questioner, you don't need, you don't need to generate banks of cells from too many donors. It's a fairly small pool. And we've done a multi-center study where we ship these cells all around the country. They've been infused at local sites. The patients that we're treating are transplant patients. Physicians are very comfortable using cell therapies in these patients. I mean, they do DLIs all the time, now more, more CAR therapies. So um, we have demonstrated that you can achieve these results even by shipping these cells around the country. And like I said, these cells are stable. You keep them in the vapor phase of liquid nitrogen. They're thawed, infused at the patient's bedside, and then they're just administered. It's, it's really very simple to implement this type of therapy. Thanks again. And by this, I would like to close this session. Thanks to all the speakers. I think we, we learned a lot and same, saw many impressive data and results from Frank Buchholz regarding tailoring recombinase, from uh, Mark Bagarazzi regarding vaccination against HPV, and also from Matti Selberg regarding the HPV, DNC and now also how novel strategies, how to deal with uh, immune infectious and immune compromised patients. So thank you very much. <laughs>